Okay, um... I think you're down to nine now. Oh, gosh. All right, so I'm down to nine. Um, it, so that takes... Okay, so if it's unknown, that means we're losing things like intellectual disorder. I don't have that anymore. Uh, ooh. Is it autism? No. Okay, because that would have been... Eight. Yeah, I think you would have given me yes it was born with. Okay, so jeez, I'm running out of things. Um, is it conduct disorder? No. Seven. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Is it intermittent explosive disorder? No. Six. Oh my gosh. Uh, <laughs> um, is uh, you were it? you were really close on one that you guessed Gee, earlier. In the last thirteen guesses. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I think it's a personality disorder, but there's so many, and it's gonna be tough. I, I already asked a Rotomania. What, what are you on? Six questions left? No, dude. Stop taking them away. I have like nine. I have like nine questions, and I'm pretty sure I you robbed me of 11. Don't be- <laughs> okay, I'm pretty all right. sure. I think I have Let's, like nine. We'll go halfway, and I'll give you seven, but I'm pretty sure I just oh, said six. I, you know what? I'm going to listen to this and be like, he robbed me. He robbed me of several questions. All right, I have seven left. I'm keeping my fingers up now. Okay, good. Okay, I think it's a personality disorder. Come on, Jim. Think about it. Personality disorders. What do you got? Um... Do you don't have rapid uh, mood cycling? Okay. Do you struggle with establishing interpersonal boundaries? Yes. <gasps> I've got you now. I have got you now. I, I so th- what? Now which, we're down to like ones, several. Which ones are you thinking? Okay, so I'm thinking histrionic personality disorder when when you're like all about you and you got problems. I'm thinking about antisocial personality disorder when when you have no empathy and you're kind of like violent and, and very cynical and very masochistic. I'm thinking about borderline personality disorder where you have really uh, strong relationships and it's like it, it, it fluxes between love and hate and very poor personal boundaries. All of those would be okay. So now, okay, I've got enough guesses <laughs> if I use those. I'd probably be okay. All right, let's start with uh, the one I'm thinking first. Histrionic personality disorder. Yes. Yes! Ah, sweet victory! Yes! I am a Barbie girl! Oh, yes, it is fantastic! Oh, oh sweet justice. Sweet, uh, sweet justice. Ah. Yeah. Oh. Nick, enjoy your new ringtone, courtesy of Professor Roberta Miranda at Nevada State College. And I just made you my Barbie girl. Yeah. Very proud do you, of it. Do you know which one that I was kind of the uh, – That distorted, the distorted thinking. Distorted. Now yeah. I get it. Now I get it. Because you're like, well, yeah. You know, you do have Because it was – I think it was uh, what, criteria eight or nine, which Gosh. is like that, that they believe relationships to be more intimate than they, than really, they really are. are. And yeah. that, that was the only one. Otherwise, I was kind of like, eh, When yeah, you said distorted kinda... thinking and then I, I started ruling out psychosis things and you were still tracking with reality and there wasn't health consequences and it couldn't be tracked or couldn't be treated with uh, therapy or psychiatric meds. I was starting to think erotomania for sure. And I thought it was going to – so for the listener, erotomania is whenever you – have a false view of other people loving you. So this is the kind of person that might be watching Oprah or watch, you know, President Trump talk on TV and then believe with all their heart that President Trump actually is in a relationship with them and that they have something secret going on or whatever. Like it's a false understanding of how other people view you, but it's delusional, like you're outside of reality. So histrionic personality disorder is a little bit different than that. I mean, it's more like this obsessive selfness, right? Where it's like, I'm very big personality. I absorb the room. I kind of bump into everybody else. So man, that was really, that was good one, man. That was a good that one. That was a really good one. And way to go with personality disorder too. Cause like, <laughs> man, that took me a long time. <laughs> yeah. that, was, that was very subtle. That was about 10 guesses just to get to that. Just to even get close. <clears throat> and luckily I had enough guesses that if it wasn't histrionic, I was just going to start burning through every personality disorder yeah. and just see if I could get there. Ah, oh, sweet victory. Sweet victory. Thank you, Professor Miranda, for that marvelous ringtone suggestion. We are so excited to be listening to that all week now as Nick changes his ringtone. Well, now I'm really nervous because you know my gym schedule. Ah, yeah. And so yeah. I'm, I'm, now you can call me when yes. I'm at the gym. That is a And if I forget idea. to put my phone yes. on silent. Yes. <laughs> Oh, I hope this happens. I hope it happens right when you're maxing out. <laughs> and I hope the guy standing in their spot and he is like, what? <laughs> it's like, hey, man, I got to go. <laughs> no, 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 hold on. No, no, I got to go. You're, you're on your own, bud. So thank All you right. again, Professor Miranda. And congratulations on your new ringtone, Nick. Excited to have it. Yes, congratulations on finally winning. Thank you. Yes. I think the sweet victory. Yes. It tastes great. <laughs> All right. And uh, so today's show is a little bit different. We actually have a lot of questions coming in to us from uh, Nevada State College. 
That's right. So uh, Professor Roberta Miranda is uh, one of the great, important people of Nevada, and she contributes so much. Nick and I have known her for years as a therapist in our community, as a clinician in our community, and now she is the professor at Nevada State College, and she has so many different courses that she teaches. But one of the things she teaches is addiction science, and she actually has students in that class, and uh, she wrote – or she had them write up questions, and so they've actually sent us a whole list of questions – and it has to do with us. It has to do with what is it like to be a therapist and the profession. Their questions are about addiction. But they sent in a whole bunch. And so today we're actually going to take their questions that they sent in to us. And we're going to dedicate uh, the second piece of the show to their class and to anybody who's interested in psychology generally and likes the wonkiness of it. And if you stay tuned, psychology students, there will actually be an extra credit question at the end of this that we are going to ask you. And if you get it right, you will get a perfect score on your next final exam. And you have approved none of this with Roberta, correct? Not a word of it. No. Okay, good. She, she is under That's... no uh, compulsion to back anything up that I'm saying. That's right. But I feel That's like how... I could talk her into it. <laughs> That's how we do things on the pod. That's right. I make promises I can't keep. <laughs> Those are exclusively the only pro- promises. I make. <laughs> so, Nick, I'll uh, I'll take the first question and I'll ask it of you. Um, so, this is a good one. So, what are your strengths as a therapist? Uh, well, some would say none. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but <clears throat> if I were to answer this myself, um, honestly, I think the the thing that I rely on most, which is probably uh, it, it, it has helped me out and really. Uh, working with my clients is the use of metaphor and storytelling. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's yeah. something that – Yes. <laughs> it's funny because as he says that, I'm thinking of all of the ones he has in his bag. Uh, Nick, tell the audience your uh, Shawshank Redemption story, the, the, the metaphor Shaw. from the movie Shawshank Redemption that you use all the time with our patients. Yeah, successfully, I Successfully, may add. yeah. It's a yes. very powerful uh, little Absolutely. metaphor. So – the Shawshank Redemption, great yes. movie. Yeah, um, at the Tim very Tim Robbins. Yeah, Tim Robbins and uh, Morgan Freeman. Morgan Freeman. Yeah. So at the end of the movie, uh, Tim Robbins escapes from Spoiler prison. Spoiler alert! <laughs> Dang it! Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Jeez, sorry. Um, so yeah, he he escapes from prison, and uh, how he does it? He chips away at the wall for mm-hmm. years. Yep. He finally gets out. He uh, breaks into a sewer pipe yep. and he crawls through the sewer pipe yep. for literally, I want to say it was like 500 yards or something like that before yep. he finally is through able to get out. Through the raw sewage. Through the sewage. And then at the end of the movie, you see him on the beach, you know, yep. um, Free, a sunny day. He's working on his sailboat, yep. you know, all Living by the life. ocean. Yeah. It's the essential uh, view of paradise. Right. Right. But – to get to that point, what did he have to do? Right. He was stuck in a cell. There was no getting out. He was serving a life sentence. Mm-hmm. There's no getting out of that cell. He had to break out. And in order to do that, he had to literally crawl through shit. Right. That's that's the classic Nick story. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and I use this example for a lot of our folks coming into treatment. Right. Because when they're coming in, it's miserable. They right. are going through withdrawal. They – um horrible detox yeah. and they feel absolutely terrible. Right. And when you get into that situation, the first thing you want to do is find any way of getting out of it. Right. It is very uncomfortable. Yes. Um, and very dangerous a lot of times. They want to give up. A lot absolutely. Of times they want to give up on getting help yeah. and just go back to their addiction. And and this is where I, I will, you know, tell kind of the story and say, you know, this is a perfect metaphor for where you're at. Mm. You want to leave here. Well, if you leave here, what are you going to do? Mm-hmm. Well, I'm going to go get high. I'm going yeah. to take away the pain. Right. And essentially that is crawling back into the cell. Yeah, the prison. There's no way out. Right. You're not going to get out that way. Mm-hmm. The only way out is through. You're already dirty. Yeah. You're already here. Yep. Crawl through it. Push and, through. And let's get to a point where right. you can get to your paradise. You're already miserable. Finish this. Because if you go back, you're going back to the prison cell. Nick has uh, a whole bunch of stories like that, but that is his classic one. <laughs> it's my and go-to. I, Nick, I will uh, I will say that that is a strength of yours as a therapist. I will also say that you keep your head. I think that you stay calm. 
uh, in the midst of crisis. I think that you're the last one to panic. And uh, I'm good at faking not panicking. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then I do panic. But at least, Nick, I panic only with you. I close right. the door first and then I look at you and you're like, dude, are you okay? Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, no. <laughs> exactly. But I uh, keep my cool in front of well, others. Right. So. And, and as a therapist, you're kind of the pilot of the plane. Right. Right. Yeah. You need to look calm for the passengers. At all times. <laughs> when that startled. cockpit door closes, right. you can panic all you want. <laughs> right. That's when you can right. freak out. Yep. All right, Jim. Uh, next question. Do you ever get frustrated with patients and how do you handle that? Oh, my gosh. It's funny, Nick, because when I hear that question, I think of some some of the patients you and I have had. <laughs> do you remember when we had uh, that epidemic in one of our programs where people kept getting – they were drinking bleach? <laughs> yeah. remember, by mistake. Yeah. <laughs> people kept drinking bleach and we would like see them and they'd be completely sick and we're like, what's going on? <laughs> Yeah. Like they, because somebody in in this program had poured like bleach in a in a vodka bottle or something, and just kept it in the laundry room to use for laundry. <laughs> but these are alcoholics, and so one of them saw it and thought, "Oh, vodka." <laughs> And so he drank it, and then he puts it down, and he goes throwing up, and another person walks over and goes, ooh, vodka, and drinks it. And yeah. before Nick and I deal with the problem, like, there's, like, three people that are, like, in the street throwing up and sick, and we're calling poison control. So, um, yeah. That was a rough day. That was a rough day. Uh, yes, sometimes I do get frustrated with our patients. Um, I think having a sense of humor really helps, uh, being able to normalize it and understand it. I think that's how we handle it. Um, yeah, I mean, the folks that we're working with are very incomplete and they're working on a lot of hard things in their life and they're not sure who they are. So <laughs> I guess that can be frustrating, but it's also very normal for us to deal with that. And so I, yes, I do get frustrated the way I deal with it. I lean in. I try never to lean away from my patients. I try to metaphorically lean in with them, get deeper into their story. And I think the more you get to know somebody, the more you join with them, the less frustrating they are in a sense because you kind of get it. You know how they tick. You know how they're thinking. And even if they're making huge errors like drinking bleach, um, you're able to see it from their perspective and see it right. more as a person who needs help than a person yeah. who's annoying. Yeah, and you get to see how they got to that point. Right. You know, yeah. And then they're you, not, you get it. Yeah, yeah. They're not, they're not acting this way just to piss Jim off. Right. It's, and you know, it, there's a lot more to it. And, and I, another thing I think that helps us is whenever somebody's being silly or being frustrating, if we have a good relationship with them, we can tell them. And so like, that's very powerful as a therapeutic tool to be able to pull them aside and go, Hey, let me tell you what you just did. Like you, you craved alcohol so bad that without thinking about it, you grabbed a bottle that you had no idea it was in there and right. you gulped. You didn't even taste. You gulped. Or smell first. Yeah, or smell <laughs> yeah. it first. Do you think that maybe you have a problem? And if you can get them to laugh at themselves and see it, then a lot of times they're able to like identify the problem. So mm -hmm. yes, they can be frustrating. And I guess we just lean in on that and try to help as much as we can. All right. All right, Nick. Next question. What are some challenges that you have overcome while working in the field and how did you do that? Um, I would say one of the biggest challenges that I had to overcome, especially early on in my career, is kind of what we would call like the imposter syndrome Oh, of you kind of get into this spot where you feel like. I don't know what I'm doing. Do you remember? And at some point, somebody's going to realize that. Do you I don't remember know what your I'm doing. first patient? Do you remember your very first session? Uh, I don't. I don't remember my first session, but I remember my first year as a uh, counselor and feeling like I don't belong. Everybody's going to figure this out. That I'm a fake. Yeah. <laughs> yep. I remember yeah. that feeling. Uh, especially in groups, uh, individual sessions, I always kind of felt like I had a good handle on. Right. Uh, but yeah, groups, sometimes it can be very scary. It's kind of like herding cats, yes. you know, <laughs> like oh, yeah. everybody goes whichever direction they want to go. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think that was, that was something I had to get over. How did you do that? Well, I, I really kind of got over it by just coming up with the philosophy. And I, I heard someone else say this once where a worst case scenario, you can always resort back to being a cheerleader. Ah, okay. You know, where, you know, if, if you feel like you're kind of getting lost in, in this session, you're not really sure where to go, fall, your, your fallback position is always be supportive, be, just be encouraging yeah. and, and be empowering. You know what helped me become a great group leader? Being a high school teacher. 
because oh, those sure. people hate you. Yeah. <laughs> they do not want to listen to anything you say. They did not sign up for this. They have to be there, and uh, you have to keep them entertained because they are teenagers. Mm-hmm. And so that's why my group dynamic is usually like, look at me, look at me. Like, you know, it's the gym show. And that's because that's how I was as a teacher. It, right. That was the only way I could keep my kids interested for, you know, 60 minutes and then do their homework or take the exam and not fail and get the information to them. So, But I know exactly what you're talking about, that imposter feel. Like, mm-hmm. I remember my 